So um, the first part, we'll talk about your family's genocide history. Do you okay. know where your family came from before they went to Syria? Yes. So on my dad's side, they were from Antab. Uh, nowadays, it's, it's called Gaziantep. It's in Turkey. It's in north of Syria, actually. It's bordered with Syria. And uh, they were a big, very big family on my dad's side uh, until now. Like, uh, it's a big uh, family, very big family. Uh, they are spread all over the world, but the first uh, stop was like Aleppo, my my dad side, and my mom's side. They, they were from Sasun. Uh, they were a small family. Um, uh, many of them uh, got murdered actually uh, during the genocide, and my great grandfather uh, reached to Aleppo, and he settled in Aleppo. And uh, he remarried after uh, after he lost his uh, wife. So yeah, that's my mom's side. <clears throat> but my dad's side, they survived. They uh, they just came with their caravans and they stopped in Aleppo. They said, okay, this is our new town, like new home, and they settled there in Aleppo. Uh, yeah. So I tapped sea from one side and Sassoon sea from the other side. <laughs> and do you know like what work they did in I tapped and Sassoon before uh, they left? Okay, um, my mom's side, I don't know, uh, but from that side, like my last name is like Bilem Jan. So, you know, the last names in the, um, in the Western Armenia, it's, it's given by their uh, profession. So when you... <clears throat> When you translate the word uh, Bilemjan, like Bilemek, it means uh, the person who uh, 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 like the sword, like what do you sword. do with sword? Oh, okay, like sharpen sword. Yeah, sharpen, yeah, sharpen, yeah, sharpen. Bilemek, it means sharpening, you know, oh. sharpening. So it seems that my great, great, great parents, they were like uh, sharpeners. We say sharp sharpeners. Sure, yeah, um, I never, uh, that's I never a word, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, sharpen the swords, yeah. maybe. So that's why they call them, okay, Bilemek, Bilemjans. So that that might be the story actually. Uh, the Bilemjan tree is very big. I once I tried to find everyone, but it was like very complex tree. So I stopped. Uh, where where did like where did you find people? Were they around? Uh, so um, like in Aleppo, there's uh, the majority of Bilemjans. They live in Aleppo. We have a Bilemjans in Jordan. Uh, recently, I just found a girl. She was like Bilemjan, and we tried to reach out like, uh, oh, who's your great? Uh, grandfather who's your great grandfather so we tried to find something but again like uh, we didn't uh, come to the conclusion that from which uh, from which uh, Bilemjan she's coming from you know mm. uh, there are Bilemjans now in uh, in Canada as well <clears throat> anyway so yeah, this is the story how they came to Aleppo. <clears throat> and do you know, you said they went like in caravans, do you know if when they left they were being forced out or if they left, you know, before uh, the violence got to Aintab? Uh, I think they left before the violence uh, started in Aintab. Uh, and Aintab was very like a cosmopolitan city uh, until now. If you go to Aintab, you see like many uh, different uh, cultures and people. Uh, it's a big city now. Uh, I've been there actually uh, after after the genocide, I mean, I just ten years, no eight years ago I was in Anta. It's a nice big city, beautiful. It 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 looks like Aleppo actually. They have also uh, a castle, uh, a fortress in the middle of the city, and Aleppo also has a same like looks like the same. You, you see like oh this is Aleppo. So yeah, uh, so they left yeah before before the genocide started. Like that. Why did you go to Anta? Why? Why did you go? Yeah. Uh, it was uh, <clears throat> so it was very close to uh, to Aleppo, and uh, we said, okay, let's do uh, let's do a tour like in all these Western Armenian, uh, like Southwest Armenian cities. So we went to Adana, Aintab, Berejik, uh, Kilis, uh, where else? Urfa, yeah. So all these cities, like we had a tour. But the biggest one was Aintab, like you see it's a city actually, you know, Adana is also a big city, uh, you know, there was a there was a big massacre in Adana as well. And how did you feel being there? Were you on with your whole uh, family? Uh, oh my God. It was nice, uh, actually, <clears throat> you know, I visited all the Armenian uh, streets uh, and uh, I saw, I have so many pictures actually of Aintab, like the churches, you see that, they're Armenian churches, you know, but they turned it up to a museum. Uh, they turned it into a museum. 
and uh, there is one like a uh, uh, big used to be a big Armenian cathedral and then it turned to a uh, prison at some point and now it's like a mosque actually you know people do go and pray uh, and the, oh, the hotel that we stayed in Hanta it was like very old town like and the people they said like here they used to live on Armenians like during the before the genocide so yeah did you know like where your family exactly lived did you no. see a house no no we didn't know actually uh, my dad was uh, like he remembered some stuff. He said like ah oh, they used to live in this street. Uh, he heard he heard something from his great great grandfather, uh, but we didn't find anything. No, everything is changed. Yeah. Um, and did you feel like welcomed by the people there? Do you think they knew you were Armenian? Uh, yes, they knew that we were Armenians. Uh, they were okay. Uh, they didn't say something, uh, but we uh, we also we didn't like insist that oh you guys did the genocide. You know. We didn't, we didn't talk these kind of things. They said, oh, the Armenians, they were very nice. We were living together, the Turkish and the Armenians. They said, like, why did you guys leave Turkey, you know? They didn't say, oh, you, you know, like we did the gen when we started the genocide and stuff. They didn't say that. They said, that, why you guys left us? Like, we were good together. We were living together. Yeah, I think this comes from the new generations, you know, like they, they're open. But yeah, the older generation, for sure. Uh, do, do you think that in Syria, um, when you talk about the genocide, when you talk about Turkey, modern day, do you think that um, most people are taught to hate Turks or to hate people living in Turkey now? The Syrians, you mean? The Arabs? No, 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 like Armenians. The when Armenians, you go to Armenian yes, school, sure, yeah. are Abu, like... For sure, yeah. The Armenians, like we, uh, in Syria, living in Syria, I mean, everyone knows, like, okay, we are survivors of genocide. Even the Arabs, they know that we are... Uh, we, we, we were victims of genocide, like our great-grandparents. Uh, they, there was a hate, for sure, yeah. Like, uh, uh, we wouldn't buy uh, Turkish products, for example, in Turkey, uh, from Turkey. So, uh, we used to go to Armenian, uh, like, um, uh, Armenian associations. We used, to, uh, uh, we used to talk about the Turkish politics nowadays, and at that time, so uh, always there was something uh, we used to hear about Turkey, you know. Uh, and do you think that now, having gone there, do you think that animosity, that like negative um, perspective towards Turkey is maybe unwarranted, like it's maybe unnecessary? Nowadays? Uh, you know, well, I think the new generation now, we, let's say, uh, the youth, we should think differently, I think. Uh, we should think politically how to solve this problem, how to make the Turks uh, to come to, uh, to uh, uh, come to an, uh, an idea that, okay, like, uh, we did a genocide, we, we organized this, everything. So, uh, because we are like neighbors, you know, like Armenia, Turkey, uh, so why don't we live all together? Uh, and the Armenians from the other side, they should uh, <coughs> uh, they should move uh, or they should go forward in a smart way, you know. Not they say, oh no, we should go uh, make war, you know, like fight, you know. We should get back our lands by war, by blood, and no, we should uh, we should work in a very smart way. Uh, so I think uh, first of all. I would say like we should increase the level of education in our generation and that's the key uh, to to reach to a solution uh, with, the with the youth in Turkey. Um, so when people talk about genocide reparations and they talk about Turkey should accept the genocide, they should admit it, they should acknowledge it um, and, and a lot of people bring up what you had said about giving the lands back and yeah. um, a lot of different reparations have been uh, suggested. So have you thought much about it? Like for you, what would be an acceptable type of a reparation for the genocide? Uh, and justice for the genocide? That's a very difficult question actually you're asking. <laughs> uh, In your opinion. <clears throat> uh, that's a bit like uh, difficult to answer as well. I'm thinking actually, you know, like uh, what would, yeah, as you said, what would be the, what would be the, the thing? The, the compensation, let's say, like, uh, oh, 
Uh, I mean, if I say like get back our lands, that's very uh, un kind of unrealistic, you know. Like, uh, uh, but at the same time, I'm thinking if we we got our lands back, are we really going to live uh, in this? Uh, cities or villages or wherever we come from. Uh, I think uh, we could maybe <clears throat> uh, we can ask or well, not ask like we can uh, we can uh, uh, demand demand this uh, the compensation of let's say the one and a half million people like the block you know the block the uh, as a money, for example, and goes to Armenia and the Armenians, and we develop our Armenia and Nagorno Karabakh, Artsakh. I think that's more realistic, you know, uh, other than like get our lands back and okay, guys, like now we have this land, so let's go back. I think no, we better like uh, concentrate, focus on our uh, nowadays lands, Armenia and Artsakh, and we develop them. We uh, for me, it's that, that's better goal. You know? <clears throat> um, do you think that an apology would be enough, like just an apology and no other? Just an apology, no, 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 no. There should be a compensation. There should be a compensation, like the Germans did for the Jewish people. You know, uh, so uh, yeah, and open borders as well. Like it should be peace in this in this small coast, you know, like in this small region. Uh, that's not good that we live uh, in, a, in, a, in a very complex area and every all the neighbors, they don't talk with each other, you know? So I'm more like into peace, you know? More than like war, blood, uh, weapons and fire, you know? <clears throat> so, yeah. Um, do you think that that's, um, do you think that in your family, like, um, it was important to talk about the genocide. Did these stories get passed down to you? And do you think if, do you think there was kind of like an intergenerational trauma in a way passed down mm -hmm. from the stories? And do you think that this kind of reparation would and could maybe fix that and let us move forward? Uh, no, we always, we, I mean, we used to talk about the genocide and I think that's important. Like we always have to talk to our children these things actually, that's our past, you know? Yeah, of course we don't have to, uh, to feel the trauma that we left, but we should know that where we come from and uh, why we're here and what we're gonna do, like what is our goals, like for the next couple of the next coming years. Uh, especially in the diaspora, the people should know like why they're in U.S., why they're in France, why they're in Russia, you know, uh, or why they're in I don't know, uh, in the Middle East, Lebanon, Syria. Uh, <clears throat> that's that's very important actually. We don't have to forget our past, but we don't have to. Uh, we don't have to. We don't have to forget. But at the same time, we should think on the future of I mean, what we have and what we can do. Not we say that oh, everything was in the past. We were very good in the past, and now we can't do anything. We're like hopeless. You know, no, we don't have to stay hopeless. We should work on our uh, uh, our future. We have a land. We have Armenia. We have Artsakh. Let's do something on that. <clears throat> Um, so it seems like to you and for you it was important to, to and it is important to be Armenian, um, and you're going to tell your kids about your family's history and, and, how, sure. and being Armenian. Yes. Um, do you think you'd also tell them about being Syrian and about your history in Syria? And of course, yes, of course I have to do that. I have to say that, like I'm Syrian, Syrian-Armenian, uh, uh, I'm a proud Syrian-Armenian, I could say, uh, I mean, so I mean, everyone knows that the like the, the diaspora in Syria, they were like strong, you know. Uh, we kept the Armenian language, the culture, the dances, food, and uh, the traditions, kind of, you know. So uh, if you go to Lebanon and ask someone, uh, Lebanese Armenian, like, where is your grandmother from? She would say like, oh, she left Syria and she came to Lebanon, or from, or in France, or in U.S. Like, uh, at some point, everyone has something in Syria, you know. <laughs> uh, so uh, my parents, they didn't, my great, great, uh, like uh, grandparents, they didn't leave Syria. They said, okay, this is our town. They start to work there. So um, we didn't leave. Of course, I would say to my children as well, like, uh, we're from Syria. And then the war started, we left, you know. 
and and so going back to like your grandparents, great grandparents settling in Syria, um, do you know where they settled? Was it in Halab? Uh, yes, yes, of course, it was in Halab. Uh, so there was a, there was a. When the Armenians, the refugees, let's say, uh, Armenians, when they came to Aleppo, they gave them a piece of a new like land just next to Aleppo, uh, and they called it uh, Norkyo. It means like new village, you know. So all the Armenians they settled there, uh, and uh, they start to build like uh, uh, houses, uh, small houses, you know, like not tents but houses. Uh, like a camp, you know, it was an Armenian camp. And uh, step by step, these camps turned to buildings uh, and small houses. So uh, now it's a very uh, populated area, still now in Aleppo, even during the war. Uh, there, there, there is an Armenian church, uh, school, two, three Armenian churches now in Norkio actually. Three schools, uh, kindergarten, elementary school, high school. Uh, I, I, I graduated from that school as well, you know. Uh, from the Armenian school in Norkio. <coughs> Which one? Uh, Jemaran, Karen Yepe Aska in Jemaran. Uh, Karen Yepe Armenian College, it's called Karen Yepe. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that's the. Uh, I need to ask for someone else. Uh, Yes, so, so they started from there, and then my 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 uh, grandfather, uh, he just uh, he left uh, Norkio, he went to Suleimania, and from Suleimania to Bilad. Anyway, like the Armenians, they moved inside Aleppo. Do you know um, for them what some of like the biggest difficulties were in starting new lives in in Syria? The difficulties, of course, whenever uh, everyone, when whoever leaves uh, the country and go to another country, uh, you will have difficulties for integration, uh, to start a new job, uh, to make new friends, uh, the language barriers, you know, the Armenians when they came to Syria, they didn't, they, they didn't speak uh, Arabic, they used to speak Turkish, Armenian Turkish, so they, they learned the Arabic language and uh, many of the Syrian Armenians, they speak Arabic fluently actually, uh, even the new generations, like me, myself, for example. Uh, so, of course, they, there were some difficulties. So, uh, but the Armenians, uh, uh, they quickly, they got integrated into the, the Arabic society, with the Arabs. And, of course, we can't forget the, the, the Arabs' uh, hospitality as well. Like, they hosted us uh, in a very good way, you know. Uh, in Aleppo, in Derzor, uh, in Kamishli, the Arabs they hosted uh, they hosted the Armenians uh, very in a very good way. How did, uh, where did you learn that? Like, who who told you those stories? Who told you that the Arabs were good? Like, how did this knowledge get passed down? Uh, Is that in school through your family? In the school, in the family as well, uh, and also whenever like I remember once we went to uh, uh, to Derzor, which is a city in a, in a desert of uh, Syria, like five six hours from Aleppo we drove, and there's a church and uh, uh, in that in Derzor and there's a school. Uh, so when we went to the Armenian Association then in Derzor, there were like pictures on the wall. Uh, you see like Arabs uh, with their dresses, you know, like Arab dresses, uh, uh, desert people, let's say, you know. Uh, and next to them, there are like children, Armenians, like, uh, so they hosted them, they gave them food, uh, they were sitting on the same table, like, from the photos, like, I know, and also they, uh, they, uh, one of the Arabs there, like, he gave a speech, like, he said, like, uh, we did this, we did that, and the Armenians also, like, they were good people, that's why we did that, uh, so yeah, uh, <coughs> school, Armenian associ associations, family, they, they, they tell the stories, actually, from the past. So the Armenians, of course, had their own community in Aleppo and they had their own institutions, but you still uh, think that they have, they also teach you the history of how you were integrated within Syria and they, there are places where both histories can kind of live together instead of just being exclusive Armenian and Syrian. Uh, there is this problem as well, like I felt that when I was in Syria, you know, uh, uh, until like 18 years old, you're kind of like living in a bubble, you know, like Armenian bubble. <laughs> uh, but when you start to work, when you start to go to university, 
and everything changes. Like me, myself, like uh, until 18, I was like with the Armenian community. I had like very few Arab friends, like from the street, from, uh, I don't know, from uh, my dad's family friends, you know, I mean family friends. Uh, but after 18, when I started to go to the university, uh, I had many Arab Muslim friends actually. Uh, uh, it was a bit like for me, oh, different in the beginning. Mm. Like they're not Armenians, you know, like, uh, and my Arabic was not perfect as them, like the Arabs. So there was like few, like some some problems, <clears throat> but then step by step, like it become uh, better. So uh, until recently, like uh, before leaving uh, Aleppo, Syria, I had many friends. We used to go to cafes, restaurants together, uh, visit each 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 other. Uh, yeah, but uh, but always there is this uh, uh, the bubble thing that. Uh, that you can't avoid, actually, you know. Do Do you think that um, uh, the Armenians in Syria um, um, like purposefully avoided Arabs, or it was more just wanting to stick with their own community? Actually, sorry, delete that question. Um, uh, why do you think the Armenians like created that bubble, and why do you think? Okay, yeah, created? that's a good question. Yeah, uh, just to preserve the Armenian Armenian culture and the language, and uh, not to be, uh, let's say, very like very, uh, uh, let's say, it's a traditional uh, traditional thing. But I mean, our like our parents, they would be a bit sad if uh, someone, if their children, let's say, is dating an Arab guy or a girl, you know, like, uh, uh, they would say like, no, why you're doing this, why you're do doing that, you know, you better go and talk with an Armenian, like, why you're dating that, uh, another person. Uh, so, uh, that, that, that's why uh, we're, like, parents, they used to, they used to send us to these Armenian associations, so at least we could get to know each other and talk Armenian, sing Armenian, dance Armenian, you know. Uh, so for you, what were some of the activities that you participated in? Uh, I've done many like uh, uh, activities in the Armenian association, like the community, community mobilization and youth uh, empowerment, let's say. Uh, programs uh, we used to organize like camps. So we used to go to Kesab. It's an Armenian village, and we had a we had a camp there, and we used to take the children there and uh, uh, teach. Uh, I mean, teach them and uh, uh, some Armenian history and talk about like stories that our like Armenian ancestors they've done uh, back in Western Armenia and in Armenia. We talk about the modern politics in Armenia, in Turkey, in Syria, you know, like, so it's kind of giving them knowledge and uh, informing them uh, about what's going on, like, these days in Middle East, in Armenia and in Turkey. <clears throat> uh, at the same time, uh, listening to Armenian songs, so always, like, you know, like, uh, and this are, I think these Armenian associations, they are important for every, for, for every diaspora. Uh, but all, but also we should not forget that we have Armenia as well. I mean, we should also, even if we are in diaspora, we should, we should make that bridge from diaspora to Armenia. This is what I, uh, well, we were lack uh, in diaspora. I don't know what what about in US, uh, but but I think uh, we should work on that more. We should make, we should, uh, we should build a very. Uh, sustainable bridge between diaspora and Armenia. Uh, we don't say like, oh, Armenia, okay, it's fine, we have Armenia. Let's concentrate. Let's focus on the diaspora. No, the diaspora also they should they should know what's happening in Armenia. You know, we should exchange people from Armenia, from local Armenians. Like they should come to diaspora to Syria, Lebanon, France, U.S., Russia, or whatever, uh, and we could send uh, Armenians to Armenia and. And uh, they should integrate in the local Armenians, not just stay with the diaspora Armenians in Armenia, you know? Uh, <clears throat> I mean, we should do that uh, uh, for the next uh, uh, coming years. Uh, yeah. Do you think, why do you think that bridge doesn't exist yet? Why, why do you think people are hesitant to integrate with one another? Uh, I think <clears throat> uh, one of the main reasons 
uh, is like uh, the people in diaspora, the the people that they are uh, they are uh, uh, they are governing or ruling these associations, Armenian. They don't know very well what is Armenia. I think these people should first come to Armenia and live here. I mean, for two, three, four years and stay here, work here, and see what's happening, and then go back to diaspora and and talk about diaspora and uh, talk in diaspora that okay guys like i was in armenia there was this there was that armenia needs this armenia is good in this armenia is bad in this so at the, in this case we could fix that bridge or we, we could have a nice sustainable bridge actually uh, is that something <clears throat> that you realized when you moved here yes and yes here? exactly exactly yes, yes 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 when i came here uh when i arrived here i realized that we were kind of far from the uh, from from what's happened from what's really happening in Armenia we didn't know what's really happening in Armenia we just know okay yeah we have Armenia we have Artsakh we have Lake Sevan Ararat we should I mean we we did Sartarabad Ashabaran all these wars to to get independence from the, the from uh, or preserve our lands you know uh, but we didn't exactly know what's going on now in Armenia now I mean, after the independence from the Soviet Union, you know, after the collapse of Soviet Union, sorry. Uh, <clears throat> and like, what are some of those things that you realize uh, are the problems here? I mean, there, there are serious problems here. Uh, uh, youth development, uh, the education system, uh, the, uh, let's say, and uh, unemployment, you know, uh, and the problems in villages, you know, there are many things that diasporans, they could easily uh, come and solve and uh, contribute, uh, you know, in this case. I'm not saying Armenia is dying, you know, but also, uh, but also there are problems that the diasporans together with the local Armenians, they could fix these problems. I mean, we have very talented diasporans in, in, uh, in uh, Middle East, in Europe, in US, uh, South and uh, North and South uh, America. Uh, so they could come and see what's happening, and they can contribute uh, to this pro to solving these problems. Uh, yeah, um, I mean Armenia is not just uh, a war uh, with Azerbaijan and genocide and uh, you know uh, these issues. There are also uh, nowadays issues problems happening in Armenia. <clears throat> So um, you have lived in Armenia, and you've also lived in like many places in the diaspora, including France. Now you go to the Netherlands, and you go to Germany. Yeah. So, do you like see yourself um, practicing what you're saying when you go to these other diaspora communities? Of do you course. See yourself, yeah. Like yes. taking these initiatives to take what you learned here and bring it there. Sure. Yeah. Uh, of course. Yeah. Whenever, uh, whenever I see Armenian, we start to talk about Armenia, about diaspora. Uh, uh, we can do this, we can do that, and I, I always like, I always uh, search for reasons, like, to do, to go back to Armenia and to do something there, you know? I mean, after the masters I was, after the masters I've done in France, I was trying to, okay, get some ideas from Europe, France, and go to Armenia and do it there, you know? I, I always wanted to give uh, my knowledge, information, whatever I, I, I got, to Armenia. And now I'm going for a PhD soon in September. And again, I'm thinking later after three years, okay, maybe, maybe I could do something for Armenia. I could talk with other professors and research labs and bring this small research to Armenia and we can do this. And uh, like we can, out, we can do, uh, we can be an outsourcing or service uh, providing companies like in Armenia for these big pharmaceutical companies. Uh, so always like uh, Armenia is in my mind and I always try to find Armenians in diaspora that we have the same idea, you know, like we could do something together uh, and work for Armenia. Uh, yeah. Do you think you thought of this before you came here? Uh, were, you, were you always looking towards Armenia before when you were living in Syria? Uh, when, uh, oh, even in Syria, I always wanted to, uh, to do something for Armenia. But uh, but I didn't realize at that moment I didn't realize what kind of things I can do for Armenia, you know. But now after living in Armenia, I've been living here for five years, and the last two years I was in France, and uh, then like after France I came here and I lived almost like eight nine months. Uh, so uh, now I know better like uh, what is Armenia, uh, uh, 
what are their needs, what are they, what, what are they good in and bad in, you know. Uh, there are some, uh, there are, uh, in some sectors, some fields, the Armenians, the local Armenians, they are even better than the, uh, than the other Armenian, diaspora Armenians, let's say, you know. Uh, we appreciate that and uh, uh, and I try to uh, uh, I mean uh, oh, I forgot the word <coughs> uh, uh, <laughs> uh, so you say in Armenian how yeah maybe I remember it's on the tip of my tongue <laughs> uh, yeah, yes, okay. <laughs> um, okay, so we'll talk about Armenia again later, but going back to Syria, um, what was your favorite part of living in Syria? Living in Syria? Your favorite, your favorite part, part of living in Syria. Mm. many friends back in Syria and now uh, everyone is spread all around the world so I think my favorite part living in Syria um, uh, how can I say that I mean we've been living in Syria like for four generations you know for us was for, for us was everything was easy you know Four generations living in Syria, like hundred, almost hundred years living in Syria. So you know everything. Uh, you can solve the problems in a very easy way. You know, if you have a, if you have a business problem, let's say, you can solve it easily. Uh, uh, and uh, you made a very uh, big. I mean, the Arabs they used to, to trust the Armenians. They used to say that always, like, oh, the Armenians, they are very good people. They work, they do their jobs in a proper way. Uh, you can trust on them, you know? That, that, that was, uh, I mean, we were uh, respected a lot, actually, by the, uh, by the Arabs, by the Syrians. Uh, so that gives you kind of like a confidence, you know? Like, oh, yes, I'm living in a country, Syria. I, I call it home. And at the same time, I feel very good in this, people, in this, uh, in this country. Uh, I mean, these things, like, when you feel very good living in a place, like, you know everyone, you go to a place and you, uh, you see uh, people, you know, they know you, uh, uh, and they talk about you, like, they say, oh, this guy, is a very, he has a very, uh, he's a very good, uh, let's say, um, uh, a mechanical engineer, you know, this guy is a, a perfect doctor, an Armenian, uh, Armenian doctor, this guy is a very good dentist, this is a professor in the university, so, uh, so always they talk, and the Arabs they like talking. They they like to say, "Oh, this guy is that, this guy is that," you know. Um, so uh, this is what I liked in Syria. The food, I love the food in Syria. <laughs> uh, What's your favorite? I mean, uh, uh, we had, for example, uh, you know, like sometimes in the morning, uh, we gathered with some friends and went to uh, the old town of Aleppo, and there was a very nice place. It's called. Uh, uh, Fawal Abu Abdo. So he used to sell uh, 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 beans, let's say, you know, we call it full. So uh, that in the mornings, like you should eat that in the mornings with a plate of uh, vegetables like onions, uh, tomatoes, and then nana, mint. Um, so uh, we used to eat that with some friends and talk in the morning, like seven in the morning before going to university or, uh, or work. Uh, yeah, and there are other foods as well that, that I like, <clears throat> uh, but now I just remember that, you know, like in the morning what, what we used to do. Uh, yeah, but at the same time I always wanted to leave uh, Syria and to go and to get higher education, you know, I wasn't thinking always to stay in Syria. Yeah. What did you study in the university? So I started... Did you go to university? Yes, I went to university in Syria for two years. Uh, I went to the pharmacy school. Uh, it was 30 minutes or 40 minutes, or no, 35 minutes from Aleppo. My university was a bit far from Aleppo. So I used to drive every morning. Uh, so I went there two years. Uh, it was a very good university, very good professors. All the professors was, were uh, Western educated. Uh, <clears throat> And then after two years, the war started. 
and we left. So I came to Armenia and I transferred all my papers and I continued here. But they put me a year less here in Armenia because in Syria everything was in Arabic, here is in English in Armenia. Of course, in Armenia there is like three uh, sections, Armenian, English and Russian. So I chose the, the English language, uh, the English uh, uh, teaching language. Uh, uh, because I always uh, wanted to go for my master's, for my PhD uh, abroad, yeah. Um, and do you think that since the war started, um, the Armenian community in Syria has gotten weaker? Uh, of course, yeah. Uh, uh, too many Armenians uh, left Syria after the war. Uh, even before starting the war, actually, in the beginning, just in the beginning, they started to leave. They felt that this war would, would continue. Uh, so they left, and now, uh, uh, until now, uh, yes, you feel that they, they are holding each other, the Armenians, in Syria, but it's not like before, you know? Uh, What's changed? Uh, now, let's say before there was like uh, eight, seven, eight schools, Armenian schools working every day, you know. Uh, now, just uh, two, three schools working. Uh, the Armenian associations, uh, some of them got closed. Uh, so uh, the community is losing its power, kind of, you know. Uh, and it's a very critical moment now for the Armenians as well, uh, you know, because the Armenians, uh, the Armenians, the majority of the Armenians, they were kind of like pro the government, and very few they're like against the government. So for the Arabs, for the Arabs, it's very important, you know, they should know like you are pro the government or against the government, and at, and to, and at that time we were kind of like. Uh, we were confused also, like, what should we say? Is he, is this guy, the Arabic guy, or our friend is from pro or against? What should we talk, you know? Like, we were kind of like, we, we weren't feeling very good. So, uh... This was during, this was like when the war was starting? Yes, yeah. When the war started, like, uh, it was kind of confusing for the Armenians, like, what to talk, to who to talk, uh, what, what subject to talk. Because we were kind of afraid, you know, what's happening. So that's why the majority of the Armenians, they're like pro-government, because uh, to not make, to not uh, create problems. But then at some point we saw that, okay, they are also against the government uh, Arabs as well, like, you know. Anyway, it was kind of confusing. Uh, uh, yeah. So, like, for you, before the war started, did you see any, like, clues or hints or signs that something was going to happen? Never, not at all. Not at all, actually. No one was thinking that there would be a war in Syria, you know? Even if when it started in the beginning, like in the south of Syria, we said, oh, it will not reach to Aleppo, you know, it will finish very soon. But no, it continued. And then when it entered to Aleppo, we said, like, oh my God, like, it's time to leave now, you know? They're like, uh, fine. I mean, there were like planes, planes and rockets, like, attacking uh, just suburbs of Aleppo we used to see, like, in the, from the balcony, you know? So, so we decided to leave uh, and come to Armenia, actually, at that time. When did you first, um, like, feel, oh, oh my gosh, it's in Aleppo, it's here? Okay, yeah, so one day, uh, there was, uh, there was a clash just uh, downstairs uh, in our building, I mean, uh, on the streets, uh, uh, in our neighborhood, actually. There was a very, uh, very strong clashes between the pro-governmental, uh, groups and uh, anti-governmental militias uh, so we said oh my god like now it's written it's just like they're gonna enter they're gonna enter to the building now you know so we were like very afraid we were on the floor even we were like in the third floor but we were like afraid we start to prowl to go inside the room um, so we said ah oh, no this is like it's getting serious now so we should really leave and then at night uh, also we used, we used to wake up from the from the rocket sound, actually. Uh, they used to attack uh, rockets uh, from uh, the neighborhood next to us to like suburbs of Aleppo, you know, like boom, you know, and then you see the light going and then another boom, like destroying a building, for example, in the suburbs. 
So we said like, no, I think we should leave. Uh, but we, we thought that we would live temporarily, not permanently, you know. So we said, okay, let's go to Armenia like for two, three weeks and let's see what, what will happen. So we came here. <laughs> Uh, two weeks become uh, two months, two months become two years, two years now. So, I uh, mean, we stay here. So when you saw those clashes like below your building, um, do you know which groups exactly they were? Like, was it like Jezhel Hara versus like... No, we didn't, know, we didn't know, we didn't know, no, no. We just know that our uh, next door building, there was like a base for government, uh, government groups. And then the, cla the other side, the clashes, we didn't know who, who were they. Uh, just a group of anti-government uh, militias. I don't know. Yeah. Um, and um, did you, while you were still in Syria, did you see anything like, um, uh, or did you hear of anyone being kidnapped? Or did you yeah, see a lot, a lot, yes. Of course, like uh, friend, not friends, yes, even friends, yeah. Uh, uh, after, yes, you know, like one of um, the first, the first explosion in, in Aleppo, in Aleppo, we were on the way to university. Uh, we heard that they uh, they exploded, they blew up uh, uh, the governmental building in Aleppo, very big governmental building in a very good area. Actually, we were surprised, like how they entered. They they uh, deployed like bombs in the car and they exploded that car. You know, yeah. So at that building, uh, one of the guardians at that time was an Armenian guy, like uh, our friend, actually. You know, a lot of many Armenians know 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 him, and he got killed. Actually, he got killed, and we said like, "Oh my God!" Like, you know, at that time we realized the Armenians are also part of this war. You know, we said because many of Armenians they used to serve the military, the Armenian, uh, the the Syrian, sorry, Syrian uh, military. Uh, so that guy uh, at that point he he was working in this building just to guard the building you know it's a governmental building so you have to guard so so when the explosion happened this guy got killed <clears throat> uh, at that time we realized that okay uh, now it's getting serious uh, and we were on the way from university and uh, in uh, in the bus we were like a couple of Armenians talking together we said like oh uh, how, what happened like uh, how comes that uh, an Armenian could be killed uh, in this terrorist attack, you know? Uh, so, yeah. Do you know which group? The... No, 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 we don't know, we don't know. Um, and how, how did you find out, like, while you were living there, what were the modes of communication? Like, how did you find out, okay, this area is dangerous, don't go there, this person was killed, how, how did news spread? Uh, the Armenian, the Armenian uh, associations, they worked a lot during that moment, actually. They used to... Uh, they used to protect the Armenian neighborhoods. They said like, oh, don't go out at this time, go there. Uh, uh, don't be, you know, around this region, around this area uh, at this moment, at this time. Uh, but again, it was like unpredictable, you know, like at some point you, uh, next to your, your building, uh, it explodes. There's a rocket comes and, uh, and it uh, explodes the building. Uh, so it was unpredictable. A lot of Armenians got killed by just uh, uh, mortars, you know, we call it mortars, these things. Uh, so uh, many Armenians, like many of my friends, uh, got injured, got killed. Uh, uh, yeah, so it's a very dangerous uh, uh, moment to, leave, to stay in Syria, that, like from 2012 to 2016, even 17. Did you ever feel like the Armenians were being purposely attacked, or was it just that they were, they happened to be? No, 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 no not purposely attacked. No, it just happened actually. Yeah, yeah, for everyone happens. So. Uh, yeah. In your understanding, like, what is the reason for the conflict? Why is there war, and why is it still going on? Uh, that's a big, very like uh, complex <laughs> question. Like you can't answer, but. But for me, I mean, in my opinion, it's uh, it's a war between the Sunnis and Shias. Actually, I mean, you know, the the Muslim, they have like two big uh, sector sectors, not sectors. What do we call uh, um, divisions? Like, division. um, uh, yeah, another sects. sects. Yeah, sects. Yes, the Sunnis and Shias. So uh, the president was uh, the majority of the population in Syria. They are Sunnis, actually, the Arabs, and the president is. Uh, is uh, Alawite, uh, which is 
which is part of uh, a Shiite uh, sect. Uh, so, so this president and his family they ruled Syria for over uh, forty years. You know, like so. The thing is, they said like, why? Okay, enough. Like, why there should shouldn't be another uh, person? Uh, you know, so. Uh, so this was one of the main reasons, what I think, and then the other uh, other reasons, like the, the international, you know, like uh, powers, they start to intervene in this conflict, and now you can't say like <laughs> what's happening actually in Syria, who's fighting against who, and uh, but hopefully it will finish this war, and, uh, because the only victims of this war is like they were the people, the population actually, yeah. Um. Um. I was going to ask you, do you think um, um, I um, do, you, do you think that the war will end soon? Uh, I don't know, uh, but after 2016, 17, 17, let's say, it, uh, uh, the situation is better now. Uh, the people are living kind of normal life, uh, but economically they're not good actually. Uh, so uh, there are few uh, few places that are under attack now, especially the rebel-controlled areas like Idlib, for example. Uh, but they say soon they will take under control. The government will take control of that region as well. Uh, so we don't know. Uh, where, where do you get your most reliable news from? Which sources? Uh, for me, uh, I just like I read Western uh, news, like let's say Western uh, news agencies websites, and also some Syrian websites. Uh, uh, pro and against uh, governmental websites, you know, I mean both I read and then I made my own conclusion like what's happening So I don't uh, just Follow one news agency, you know and say okay, this is a true. No, I always like to listen uh, both sides pro and against uh, Even in the Western uh, news agencies that are like pro uh, Assad government and against the government So I read uh, both of them actually and then I make my own conclusion um, do you think that um, after the conflict there should be some type of um, justice in terms of, let's say, a court case, like a tribunal that's created, or maybe reparations, like monetary, monetary compensation, or rebuilding everyone's building, or like what kind of uh, post-conflict reparation, just like we talked about for the genocide, mm. like what do you think it should be for Syria? I don't know. This is, uh, again, like it's very... Uh, uh, very specific question, like you could ask for a lawyer or something. But uh, I think, you know what, like, if, if the government or the Assad power, let's say, uh, wins this war, and it's kind of winning actually, yeah. I think the other side, they would be recognized as terrorists like during the history, you know? And in the coming years, in the books, they will write like, Syria was a victim of uh, terrorist groups. And although in the beginning, the rebels, like uh, they started peacefully and then it turned to clashes and very fast actually, but everything would be, would be uh, forgotten. Like uh, if, uh, if, the, if, the, if Syria, if the government, the Syrian government uh, wins the war, you know? They were just mentioned the books, like they were, they were like, uh, uh, terrorist militias, they, they wanted to uh, kill the people and destroy Syria. Uh, <clears throat> on the other hand, if the, if the rebels, if they won this war, they would have, of course, they would have, uh, they would have uh, created like special courts just to, uh, to judge the war criminals, the government people. So, uh, yeah, it's up to that. Who wins the war, actually? I mean, again, during the history as well. Uh, the, the, the countries, or let's say the empires that they won the war, they just made the history. They just wrote, uh, they just, um, yeah, 
wrote the history themselves, you know, like, so nobody exactly would know, like, what happened, actually, during the history. Yeah, that was a very wise answer. Um, do, you, do you think that um, for the Armenians, there should be any specific, like, special, or even just the minority communities in mm. Syria, there should be any type of, like, different... Um, precaution, like things put in place after to make sure that the minority populations are protected, like should there be any kind of special um, consideration for them after the war? Or even just for the Ar Armenians, if you can't speak for all the minorities, uh, like in your opinion? I think all the minorities in Syria should be treated uh, equally, you know, like I don't say like, oh, the Armenian minority should be uh, uh, privileged or they should be uh, treated in another way. No, but uh, recently there were some uh, governmental visits to the Armenian Association and the Church, and uh, they wanted to renovate, I mean, to contribute to the renovation of the Armenian churches, let's say, the schools. So, uh, yeah, they're trying, the government is trying their best, like, to, to, make, uh, to make the Armenian minority uh, stay in Syria and contribute to the Syrian development at the same time, you know? I mean, it, it couldn't be from one side we can't expect just the, Armenian, uh, the Syrian government just helping the Armenian community. On the other hand, the Armenian community is leaving Syria and going uh, abroad, you know. Uh, but many of the Syrian Armenians, they're thinking to go back to Syria uh, and to re-establish something there, actually. They, they start their work. Uh, many of them, many family, friends, actually, they, they went back to Syria and they started their jobs there, actually. Uh, because it's, it's, if, yeah, because it's the country that they uh, made uh, their fortune, they made, uh, they built their houses, uh, they bought their shops, their, their cars, you know, like everything is, all their uh, stories, histories, are, the memories are there, you know, so you can't forget easily these things. Do you think if the Armenian community didn't go back and if it got much weaker, that Syria would be losing something by losing the Armenians? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Of course, yeah, so Armenians gave to Syria so many things. Uh, uh, Arme Armenians contributed to the Syrian uh, development during the history and even now, I mean, they're trying to do their best. Uh, there are many big Armenian businesses that they contributed to the Syrian economy. Uh, many Armenian like uh, intellectuals, actually Syrian, intellect Syrian Armenian intellectuals that they contributed to the, to, to the culture and to, uh, uh, to to present uh, Syria in, into the world, you know. Uh, so, uh, of course, uh, uh, it would be uh, bad if, if Syria loses the Armenian community. Do you think you would ever move back there? Uh, it's, again, it's a difficult to answer to this. Uh, but, but why not? I mean, uh, again, like as I said, I'm going for uh, for my higher education, for PhD, and in, in biotech, pharmaceutical research. So why not? Maybe at some point I will I will also visit go visit for sure Syria, yeah? go and maybe work there, like uh, in in university and uh, and uh, and. Uh, uh, give uh, my knowledge uh, and teach the new generations as well, like, uh, why not? I mean, because I'm, I also feel like I'm part of Syria, you know? Uh, I didn't forget completely Syria. So, yeah. Um, okay, so leaving Syria, how did you leave? Did you take a bus? Did you take, uh, like, to Lebanon or yeah. car? How did uh, you leave? We, uh, we took a plane from Aleppo and... Uh, it, there was a direct flight at that time. It was like the last three, four flights that uh, Armavia, uh, mm -hmm. yes, Armavia had. Uh, Do you remember the year or the month? Yes, it was like 2012, August 14. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, recently you had your anniversary. Oh, yeah, that's right, yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, and you said so you got one of the last flights out. And yeah, it was one of the last flights. After like two months, they stopped all the flights actually, and all the people they start to come by buses, minibus, uh, cars. It was dangerous actually. There were so many problems on the roads, uh, you know, kidnapping. Uh, yeah. And um, your family decided to leave because you didn't want to wait. To see uh, actually, my family they were thinking to go. Uh, they were uh, thinking that this this uh, trip would be like temporarily, like after two three weeks would 
we would come back to, to Syria. But me personally, I didn't feel that. That's why I took all my papers, university papers, my computer, my old like documents, you know, like with me, because I was thinking like, I think this will be my last uh, flight, like to, uh, I mean, my, my, I'm living like uh, for good, you know, Syria. Uh, so that, that's why it was easy for me, like to transfer my papers, my university documents and everything. And I start uh, uh, very quickly in my university years. Why did you guys choose Armenia? Why? Uh, uh, there was like two ways. Either we go to Lebanon or Armenia. We say, okay, uh, let's see. Or like, we haven't been to Armenia. My parents they wouldn't have been, they wouldn't have been to Armenia before. So we say, okay, let's go to Armenia. Two three weeks, we rest there, and then we come back to Syria. So that was the reason, actually. You know, like a vacation, but the vacation turned out to be our uh, next home, actually. <clears throat> Had you been to Armenia before? Yes, in 2008, 2008, there was an Armenian jambar, uh, Armenian camp. Uh, we were like, uh, I don't remember, 700, 800 people from all around the world, youth, like 16, 17 years old. Uh, so we camped in Armenia. It was a very nice memories. Until now, I have friends from that year, like 10 years ago. And recently, one of my friends from that camp, she got married, actually. Uh, yeah. So yeah, we went to the wedding. Married. Yeah, I was at the wedding actually. She's from Iran, like Iranian Armenian. So, uh, yeah, we made good memories at that time. Yeah. Do you remember when you first came to Armenia, like how you felt? Uh, the first time? At the... The first, oh, yeah, the first time, first time, yes. In 2008, I was like, oh, yeah, finally, I saw, I see Ararat, I see Lake Sevan, you know, like. <laughs> It was something else. Like we all, we used to see these things like in a, in, a, in a books actually, and now everything was real. Yeah, until now, whenever I see Ararat, I really feel something else, you know? Maybe my local friends, they don't feel that, because every time they see that. But even though I lived here for five, six years, but I still feel that, oh, that's something else. I feel, I feel another energy, you know, uh, when I see Ararat. <clears throat> Why do you think that is? Uh, yeah. Uh, Because we used to talk a lot during the during back in the diaspora in Syria, we used to talk a lot about Armenia, the culture, language, or Armenian uh, like kingdoms during the history. I mean, we know that Armenia is kind of a very um, special, a special nation that used to live, uh, that still living in this region actually. So, why? I mean, we need to, we have to preserve, we have to protect, we have to work to, uh, to, to, to make the Armenian nation uh, uh, live forever in this lands, on these lands. Uh, yeah, and me personally, I'm a very patriotic person, actually. Uh, maybe you noticed that from my interview, like I mentioned a lot, Armenia, uh, Artsakh, development and the work. I, mean, uh, I always want to do something good for Armenia as well. Uh, so yeah. So living in Armenia now, you've been here for like five years. What were some of the difficulties that you like faced when you first moved here for good? Like, uh, the challenges of like starting a new life here in Armenia. Um, I would say like there was some uh, small period of integration difficulties, challenges, you know. I mean, although we're Armenians, like, uh, we thought it would be, oh, very easy to be integrated, but no, I mean, there is like small uh, cultural differences, uh, even the language, I mean, the, the Armenians here, the locals, they use uh, uh, Eastern Armenian, and we talk in Western Armenian, uh, we understand each other, of course, but but there is this question at the same time, oh, uh, you're from diaspora, where are you, are you, are you Syrian, you know, you're from Syria? Uh, but hopefully, fortunately, there wasn't a big problem between Syrian Armenians and the Armenians. Uh, the opposite, they used to like us, so they used to accept us in a, in a very in a quickly way, in a very good way, actually. Uh, compared to like uh, Lebanon, for example, if you're Syrian in Lebanon, it's a very problematic now. It's a, it's a big problem. Uh, but uh, here in Armenia, everything is good. Uh, so the integrate, I could say, the integration was one of the biggest challenges for me. Uh, what else? Yeah. In the beginning, I didn't have like uh, local Armenian friends, but now I have more local friends than like uh, the Aspern, for example, or Syrian. Uh, 
Yeah. And you got here in August, so did you start school right in September? Yes, yes, end of September, mid-September I, I started actually. Uh, but uh, the school, so I told you, like I chose the, uh, the in the English section. So in my group, we were all like uh, foreigners and diaspora Armenians actually. So we didn't have that much integration with the local Armenians, like in the university. But uh, I've done, I mean, during my studies, I've done many like volunteering uh, jobs and uh, work with different uh, organizations. So it was the moment that I started to make friends, Armenian local friends, actually. And uh, it was amazing, actually. And uh, I always wanted to do, uh, I always wanted to, uh, uh, to bring my other diaspora or Syrian Armenian friends uh, to also make them integrated in the, into the society. Uh, yeah. What are um, some of those organizations that you worked at? Okay, so uh, I started, uh, the first one that I volunteered was the YMCA. Uh, there's a nice, still now it works, there's a nice big YMCA Syrian Armenian group. Uh, that they organize camps, uh, 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 other cultural events and stuff. Uh, so I volunteered with them and uh, after that I volunteered with uh, Casa Swiss Foundation and finally I ended up uh, at UNHCR, United Nations uh, uh, UNHCR. Uh, so in the beginning I started, I started as a volunteer and then I started, I, I interned there actually. Uh, uh, and I was working, so, uh, so my, my project was, uh, my project was integration. <laughs> because uh, the, the same question asked me when I was like, uh, when, I, when I interned uh, with UNHCR, they said, like, what is the biggest challenges that youth, a Syrian Armenian youth, could could have here? I said, like, integration. So they said, like, we are working on that. We are. We want to work on that. So I was in the the integration uh, project, uh, and my work was like to integrate the youth, children, and everyone in the into the Armenian society. Not only Syrian Armenian refugees, like Syrians, uh, the other refugees that we have, Iraqi refugees we have. Uh, we have other African refugees as well here, like very small community of Africans that they should be integrated here in Armenia. So, uh, so I've done, uh, I organized many activities uh, in Armenia with the UNHCR, like cultural events, sport events, uh, sport competitions, uh, art exhibitions, uh, other like uh, many uh, events for children. And every time we used to gather many different people from, from different nationalities, Armenians, Syrians, uh, Iraqis, uh, foreigners, uh, diaspora Armenians. Uh, so we used to make that event and uh, to try to integrate uh, uh, everyone with each other in, into the Armenian society. And I, I used to, I, mean, I felt very happy when I see a Syrian or Iraqi person talking with an Armenian, local Armenian person, or an African playing football uh, with the local Armenians, actually, you know? Uh, I remember in 2014, I organized uh, a, a, a football competition. There, there were like 15 group, 15 teams, actually, 15 different teams. And it was mixed, actually, you know? You can't imagine. And finally, the African team won. Uh, they are refugees or asylum seekers. Uh, and they accepted to play football with the other people. It, it was one of sometimes. It was kind of the first time that the people they they saw uh, Africans that they are living in Armenia and working actually and playing football with them. Uh, the Africans, the Africans were happy. The Syrians were happy. Uh, there was a team. It was a mixture of uh, Syrian, Lebanese, Armenian, and an African guy. Actually, that was amazing. You know that that's an integration. Uh, so, uh, and then uh, another project was like to, uh, we made, uh, we actually, we were working a lot with the local universities, the Armenian uh, universities, so uh, 314 uh, senior students, they got accepted to the Armenian universities and they continued their studies. So uh, we, we, we didn't want uh, a generation to lose an education, so that was one of the biggest uh, 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 achievements, accomplishments uh, for uh, for the for the Syrians here to continue their studies. Actually, I was one of the, one of them. Actually, I also continued my studies. 
so uh, the UNHCR with uh, with uh, with the collaboration with uh, AGBU and uh, the government and other Armenian associations, they granted uh, they granted uh, um, they funded and granted the Syrian students uh, to continue their studies in Armenia, in the in the public universities. Uh, yes, so uh, that was a very good experience working with uh, UNHCR and working with the youth and children here in Armenia. Were some of those your initiatives, like they were your ideas? To, to uh, the, the, you yes, especially yes, the sport competitions, the sport events and the cultural uh, activities actually that, uh, uh, that I've uh, organized. Uh, like there was uh, one, one day, uh, okay, you know that. Many Syrian Armenians here, they are like very good cook, you know. So uh, we came up into an idea to to org organize international cuisine. Uh, so there was like Syrians, Lebanese, Armenians, uh, Georgians, Armenians from Georgia, Africans, uh, different uh, cuisines actually. We we did that in at the Lovers Park. It's working right. We did that at the Lovers Park actually. There was a music cuisine. Everyone was tasting, you know, like different things. So it was a nice event as well. And that was for 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 the refugees and their families actually. So some of them they start to sell their products. Uh, yeah. And all these people they have they all had refugee status, like in the Syrian Armenians. Uh, or no. a lot of them had citizenship status. No, so no. Many of them they have a citizenship, but still they're under the refugee. They are like you know what? Like although they are like citizens, but. Uh, uh, but they are they had they passed the same uh, path of the refugees actually so that's why the international organizations they considered the Syrian Armenians as refugees uh, yeah they're not asylum seekers yeah, either they are refugees or citizens or they are Sy with Syrians with their Syrian passport for example you know like, uh, and um Working with UNHCR, did you um, notice like any difference between the Armenians who came and sought refugee status and the ones who got citizenship? Like, were there? No, not at all. Not at all. I mean, both of them they were treated well. Uh, we didn't say like, oh, this is a refugee. Uh, he he he, ta he takes uh, a different bene uh, benefits. No, like uh, there are many uh, Armenians, Syrian Armenians uh, that. They got benefited from the UNHCR projects programs until now. Actually, there are many uh, programs actually happening uh, in Armenia. Do you think that many Syrian Armenians knew that they could go to these organizations for help? Like, I think you said you were okay. Also. So, so in the beginning, it was difficult. Actually, that was also one of my mission, like to try to uh, to get the Syrian Armenians, the Syrians, the refugees, to come and to enter to these organizations. In the beginning, they were afraid of UN. When you say UN to a Syrian person, they were like, oh. Is this an American association? They want something? They are spies or what? You know, like. Uh, but then, step by step, they start to realize, no, uh, these guys are like human. It's a, the biggest humanitarian organization in the world. You know, like. So and they are doing some good uh, and uh, <clears throat> uh, events, or uh, uh, they have good projects actually for the refugees. So uh, and then they start to call me and text me like, Brur, is there something? Uh, where are? Oh, is there some, something that you're organizing or a new project or a new I don't know program that we, we could get help? You know, uh, in the beginning it was difficult, but then it's fine now. Like UNHCR is uh, is like the is the key uh, to uh, to to all the projects and the programs actually. You know. Do you, how did you decide that you wanted to work with them? Why did you? Decide? Uh, why I decided so uh, uh, so I, as I told you like I used to volunteer a lot like volunteering was one of my favorite things let's say hobby you know and then uh, and then uh, uh, a person who was my supervisor at the end uh, she asked me like uh, she saw that I'm an active person, like I could organize some stuff and lead some things, you know, manage some stuff. So she said, really, like, why don't you come and work with us? Like, uh, we could uh, give you the opportunity to work with us and uh, we can organize together. And she was a very active person as well. Uh, I said, okay, but I said, I'm like studying at the same time in pharmacy school. She said, no problem, like, you can come whenever you want, you can, we can organize, we can work together. I said, okay, so uh, I started to work with them. and. 
I don't, I, and also like UNHCR is a very like a, a, a proper uh, organization, <clears throat> you know. So uh, yeah, uh, that's why I I volunteer with them and then I intern with them. And until now, like uh, uh, if something happens, like uh, or someone wants something, uh, I send them like to UNHCR. You know, I tell them like go to UNHCR and ask for help or something. I had that humanitarian heart, you know, like uh, I still have for sure. Yeah. Do you think that um, now, like, like, what are some of the initiatives now that they're doing now that like the largest influx has kind of died down? And uh, yeah, yeah, we don't have, I mean, there's no influx anymore. Uh, but still, there are many students that they need help, you know. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Uh, um, so, uh, what do you think like uh, the UNHCR's biggest role was during your time working with them when the biggest influx was coming in? It was the like, biggest influx, yes. Well, 2000, 2012, 13, yeah. 14, thir yeah. And what was like the, their, their main role? Who? The UNHCR's role? Like to... Okay, so the main role was like... Uh, protection. I mean, to inform to the government that these people are refugees. Uh, these people are like... Uh, a war, uh, let's say, um, victims, you know, like, uh, so UNHCR is the main key to collaborate with the government, actually. The government used to listen to UNHCR and, because it's like a reliable source organization. And then UNHCR started to collaborate with the other Armenian organizations, uh, local organizations. Uh, so UNHCR is like an uh, umbrella, you know, for, for all these organizations. And, uh, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, like uh, UNHCR is also like granting uh, funds to other like organizations, local organizations, reliable organizations, uh, to continue working with the Syrians. Actually, uh, so yeah. Uh, um, do you do you think that um, the Syrian Armenians being here in Armenia have like strengthened uh, any of the? Armenian sentiments or Armenian uh, associations or anything? Have, like, what have they added to the country? Ah. Uh, I mean, yeah, they brought... Uh, they brought their culture, you know. I mean, although we're Armenians, but we, we lived in a Syrian Arabic culture, so we brought that new culture here. Uh, we brought the new uh, food. And uh, uh, you see, you, you can find many Syrian... Armenian uh, Syrian restaurants like in Armenia now and the Armenians the locals or foreigners or whatever they love this food you know that's one of the <laughs> the the main thing that you can you can uh, realize uh, something is new in Armenia if you were here like 10 years ago and now it's different you know like there's new uh, color here and <laughs> new restaurants uh, what else like uh, not only the food um, uh, uh, I have many friends because they speak Arabic, actually, uh, they start to work with the Arab tourists, actually. And now uh, there are many Arab tourists that the guides or the tour, uh, I don't know, let's say the tour organizers, they are, they are Syrian Armenians. So that's good for the economy of Armenia as well. Uh, one of, I mean, uh, the best um, uh, uh, car repairs, car repairs, or what do you call car it? Mechanic. Car mechanic. The, car, the, the best car mechanics in Armenia now, they are Syrians actually. Uh, I have many Armenian friends, they say like, oh, Vril, please tell us a Syrian Armenian uh, mechanic, we want to take our car there, you know? So, uh, yeah, uh, they brought many things here. Um, and so, why did you decide to um, go and study abroad and not stay in Armenia to do higher education? <coughs> okay, so... Uh, I always had the goal, like to uh, to continue my studies, uh, to go for a masters, and then why not a PhD? And uh, but it doesn't mean that I'm leaving Armenia like permanently. Uh, I would always like come back here and contribute to this country uh, and uh, exchange my knowledge with the youth here. Uh, as I told you in the beginning, like uh, uh, like yeah. Maybe 
I don't have, I mean, it's not logical like to talk now to tell you, oh, you know, I'm bringing a new research center here to Armenia, but it might be a reality uh, in the what you, future. What are you studying? So uh, I studied pharmacy and then I did my master's in pharmaceutical engineering. And now my PhD will be on uh, biotech cancer research. So we, we're going to work on a new uh, uh, drug that, uh, that would be used for late stage breast cancer. Uh, so we're trying to find the formulation for that drug. Uh, so uh, it's a drug development program. Uh, it's, a, it's an immunotherapy actually. Uh, so it's an interesting project actually. Uh, and I applied for this pr project. Uh, the process is a bit like difficult to get into it. Uh, but it's a consortium of four countries actually. Germany, Netherlands, uh, Czech Republic and Israel. Uh, so I'll be working with these people uh, and to, to come up with this new drug. <coughs> uh, so yeah, maybe uh, we could now, as you know, like Armenia is, is an IT hub for, for the world, you know. So why not we could make it a biotech hub as well, like in the future we could provide services to the big pharmaceutical companies. Uh, during this eight months or seven months that I was uh, staying in Armenia, I was working in a company here. Uh, it's a CRO company, contract, contract Research Organization. It was called FMD. So uh, these people are doing a very good job. Uh, uh, they are like a service providing company for big pharmaceutical companies, like uh, paperwork, regulatory affairs, pharmacovigilance. So, so it, it seems that Armenia could be a very good uh, hub for also, also for the pharmaceutical and biotech companies for the future. Uh, uh, but we need the youth, the ready people that they could, they could merge or they could, <clears throat> they could uh, as I said, they could make a bridge between like the West and Armenia or the diaspora and Armenia. Uh, there are many initiatives now like diaspora Armenians, like uh, they're coming here and starting something here. So we should have that, uh, that uh, uh, gunk, what is gunk in English? We should have that. Spirit. Uh, desire. Desire, yeah, maybe we should have that desire to do that. Yeah. Um, so, what in the next, you know, 10, 20 years, <laughs> what do you hope for um, Armenia? Uh, uh, good, like, uh, I want like the youth to continue their education, like to study more, to uh, 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 to do something wisely, you know, to think that, okay, Armenia is good in this field, okay, let's, let's focus on that. Uh, an example, for example, an example I want to give, like my sister, uh, when uh, she just uh, finished her high school, she was thinking like, okay, what should I do now? Which, which field I should go, which university I should go? Uh, so she started to make uh, some lists, you know, like, sh should I have to go to the business school or I don't know, uh, chemistry school. Uh, and at the end, like she realized, or, and also we talked with her a bit, uh, and we said like, okay, Armenia is now good in IT, software engineering and uh, programming and stuff. Why don't you go into it and maybe you could be good in it. So she entered to the, uh, to the IT uh, at the AUA, uh, American University uh, Computer Science. And now she's studying and she's happy, although it's very difficult, but she said like, I'm happy that, that she, uh, there is something for me to do here in Armenia, you know? Uh, so I would say, uh, uh, let's think wisely what we can do for Armenia. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, I'm hopeful that Armenia will be uh, a high tech uh, country, let's say. Armenia would contribute in a high tech in the near future. Uh, during the Soviet times, it was also a, a hub for IT, for other things actually. Uh, why not now, like in the future? Um, and what do you hope for Syria? Uh, Syria is also like, I consider it as a hometown. Uh, peace. Uh, I hope that the war will finish soon. Uh, uh, yeah, again, uh, Syria is a very beautiful country. It's the heart of Middle East, actually. Uh, uh, I mean, if you 
if you see if you uh, or if you if you read the history like there are many civilizations like created got, or uh, many empires civilizations they came and settled in Syria in the Middle East so I think uh, it's not good to destroy this country completely like I get sad if I see uh, a temple or uh, an old uh, uh, an old uh, castle or a fortress got destroyed or an old town got destroyed like so I hope that the war will finish soon and the people will um, let's say not if, I, I don't know like if I say like everyone will go back but I don't think all the people will go back to Syria uh, it's a bit difficult uh, for Syria to to reach to the same level that it was uh, a couple of years ago. But hopefully it will be good, and I'm ready also to contribute for, for my country, Syria, as well. Uh, so I'll, I will contribute for both, like Armenia and Syria. <laughs> Last question, what do you hope for yourself? Um, uh, I hope that, um, okay, uh, I hope that I will, uh, I will, <clears throat> I hope that I will reach to a level uh, uh, that I would be ready to contribute uh, to my hometowns. <laughs> uh, so I hope that at some point I will get a phone call from an Armenian university and tell them like, Guru, come and uh, give us a lecture. These people, this youth, they need you, you know. Uh, give us your knowledge, like what did you learn, what are you doing now, so uh, uh, I hope for that, uh, and also like, let's say, uh, uh, to go further for this uh, research things actually, because also like cancer research is, is an up-to-date research, you know, and uh, it's an important to find a cure, a treatment for, for cancers, different types of cancers. So I hope my team and me will work and go further with this and find a cure or another developed better drug for cancer.